Three years after being formed in 1967, Fleetwood Mac founder and lead guitarist Peter Green left the band after struggling with his personal and mental health in 1970, where shortly after he would be diagnosed with schizophrenia and later leave show business completely and give up music as a whole. However, Green felt it would be disingenuous to just leave his 59 Les Paul behind in storage not to see the light of day. So Green had the idea of selling the guitar, but only to an artist who would put it to good use, so he could see it go to a good owner and someone worthy enough to play it. The only person that came to mind was his good friend Gary Moore, who just in fact was in search of an upgrade. So as fate would have it, Peter would sell his guitar, but only at the fraction of the cost, due to a very interesting term in a deal he had made with Gary. You know, a guy who came from East London, you know, a white Jewish kid who came out and played the blues. His music was very spiritual. It wasn't just someone standing up there playing the guitar. It just seemed like it was coming from somewhere else. And of course, you know, there aren't that many white blues players who have managed to convince people that, uh, that they were the so-called real thing. But if anyone ever asked me, uh, about white blues guitarist, I always point them towards Peter Green and say, well, there you go. And he's had all the accolades that anybody could have from B.B. King, from everybody. B.B. King said that Peter's tone was the sweetest tone you know, he'd ever had, and it made him sweat, and he, he said all these amazing things about him. So I think he knows what he's talking about. The guitar that I use is Peter's actual guitar, and I've had that since virtually the time when he left Fleetwood Mac. Uh, he let me have that in the early 70s. He let me have it for a few days and then he called me up and asked me if I wanted to buy it. And I said, well, there's no way I'd be able to afford a guitar like this. And he said, well, uh, if you sell your main guitar, give me the, whatever you get for that, give it to me. And it would be like kind of swapping guitars because it wasn't like a money thing. He just wanted it to have a good home. Anyway, <laughs> I sold my guitar and gave him the, some paltry amount, which wasn't anywhere near what the guitar was worth but he he let me have it and I said well if you ever want it back you can have it and he said well I'll never ask you for it back but I've, I've had it ever since then and that's the one that's on the album that's the one I'm playing today Anyways, Gary would become the sole owner of the guitar and use it for several years, even doing a full tribute album to Peter Green, where he would record and later tour a cover of Peter's greatest hits, live on that guitar. But after toying with it and playing nonstop in and out of the studio with it, it became too much of a liability to take on tour and the cost to repair it would become a nightmare. Not to mention, Gary was already in a bad financial situation and the bear of owning the guitar almost Almost seemed too great for even Gary to continue to own. And to pay off his ever-growing debts once and for all, Gary Moore sold the guitar in 2006 for an undisclosed price. However, a price that's believed to exceed the six-figure mark. And Gary would later cite it as a great regret of his. So who would become the owner of the former Peter Green and Gary Moore guitar? Well, the guitar actually ended up being bought by Phil Winfield of North Carolina's Maverick Music, who was a music shop owner and was a huge fan of both Peter and Gary. However, Gary had created a special stipulation for the guitar, stating that the guitar cannot be sold to an independent guitar dealer or flipper and that it cannot be advertised for sale by Maverick Music whatsoever. However, with all the publicity after the sale, Maverick Music later listed the guitar for $2 million and breached the contract term originally made with Gary and was sold to an anonymous collector against Gary's wishes. Shortly after the sale and during all the speculation over the owner of the guitar, Gary would publicly dismiss Maverick Music and go off over what really happened. Anyways, the guitar is said to have switched hands numerous times until 2014 when it was offered to Kirk Hammett of Metallica, who would have this to say about acquiring the instrument. The relationship I have with this guitar, I mean, is is kind of on the same par as the relationship that everyone else has with this guitar. <laughs> you know, it's an iconic guitar and it's beautiful and it plays incredible and it has quite a story. And I feel very fortunate to be able to add to the story of this guitar. A guitar dealer named Richard Henry uh, called me up here in London in, in, in 2014, I believe it was, and said, I have a guitar for you. And I said, okay, Henry, what guitar is it? And he said, it's the Gary Moore, that's Paul, it's greeny. And I said, hey, wait a second. 
I know what the price is on that guitar. I'm not interested. And he was like, oh, hold on. It's all poppycock. And I said, okay, bring it by. And he brought it by with like a small Marshall combo. And, you know, the combo didn't have a master volume on it. So I had to crank it up in my hotel room, yeah. which is what I, I prefer to do. You know, get that amp right to that point when the... The, that sweet spot where the speakers are sounding really good. And I freaking hit a chord. I was like, whoa, full. And I put it on there and, you know, I played some stuff. Fucking incredible neck pickup. And then I put it in the middle. And see, this is the aspect of, of Greeny that not a lot of people know about. But when it's in the middle and you have both pickups on and this is inverted... It, it creates an out of phase sort of sound, kind of similar to in between when you you know like on a strat when you put it you know three positions you put it in between the first and second position. Sure. Similar idea, uh, similar result. It brings out a, a weird sort of weird mid that isn't that really doesn't exist unless you, you put it in, in this position. Yeah. And it sounded to me, it sounded like a uh, like a Strat through a Marshall yeah. cranked. And I thought, oh my God, this is this guitar is just kind of like a walking contradiction. Yeah. You know, it's a it's an amazing neck pickup sound. You know, super full, super biting, totally like killer bridge sound. But here, it's it's like magic. A lot of the tone is in the neck itself because it has a pretty beefy neck. And also, and a lot of people don't know this, but the neck has been cracked off. Um, and that's because when it was in Gary Moore's boot of his car, the boot of his car, <laughs> uh, better known as the trunk, um, he got rear-ended and the, the, the neck got broken off. So it got put back on. And, uh, you know, for those out there who don't know, whenever you break a neck on a Les Paul and, you, and then you get it repaired and plug it in, always sounds better. Always sounds better. It's quite a price yeah. <laughs> to get your guitar to sound better. But once the, 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 this guitar was repaired and Gary Moore got it back, I think he was blown away by how, how, the, how much better it sounded. It's just a reinforced aspect. Yeah, so yeah, I don't know what mm. it is, you know, added mass. I don't know what it mm. is, you know. Yeah, it's cool, when I look at this, see that? That's from Gary Moore, you know. Mm. When he played, he would rest his fingers right there and play. Mm. And I just love that, you know. Gary put that on there, he put that on there. I mean, you know, his driving put that on there. Amazing. I mean, these wear marks, it's, it, it's just an insane instrument. Because that's the thing, not, not everyone will know this, but you know, you are a huge Peter Green fan. Yes, and, and uh, Peter Green and Gary Moore. Of course, both. Yeah, both. yeah. But just with uh, the reason I'm, I'm bringing up Peter Green was because his images when he's holding that guitar, you can clearly see that that's not there at yeah. that point. Oh, you yeah, know? Yeah. So it's, yeah. uh, it's quite something to see. And, uh, you know, obviously through the years, you'll add your own little uh, marks and yeah, stuff to yeah. it as well. Yeah, I sweat all, all over this guitar every night, you know. Yeah. So how often does it get played during the set uh you know i play it for at least two or three songs mm. you know i i like to play it for for the more ballady stuff mm. because this neck neck pickup when it's on a clean tone it's like such a nice clear tone yeah and then when i go to the heavy sound it's great and then when i went go to lead i'm just like i'm ready to kick it out you know Definitely. it's a really inspiring instrument i have to say i mean I uh, um, I'm very very happy to 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 be able to be the the caretaker of, of this guitar. Sure. It really does belong, you know, in, in like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Okay. You know, I I I'll, I'll admit it, it it's it's historical, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it, it's contributed a lot to to, to uh, modern music or the music that we like, you know. Um, but as of now, she, you know. I don't think she's ready to retire. So as it turns out, Kirk Hammett from Metallica would end up buying the guitar from Richard Henry less than the advertised asking price, and since 2014 has remained the sole official owner of the guitar. Now on tour with Metallica, 
Kirk frequently plays the guitar and with the right help around him, maintains the guitar very well and has the ability to more than afford the guitar and keep it as long as he wants to. Plus, give the guitar a home it's finally been waiting for. But what do you guys think about the guitar? What do you think about this whole crazy story? And where do you think the guitar will end up next? Let us know in the comments down below what you think. And until next time, I'll see you guys in the next video.